What's up YouTube, Dow here from Zephyr War Games, and today I am bringing you an update and of course first place profile of Dark World Dangers. You guys voted for it so I updated it, put it together, adapted it for my local environment and did incredibly well. It ended up taking on Sprites, Flunders, Exosisters, Revenge Match, here we go, and of course Flunders as well. There was a card that I put in the main deck specifically for Flunders and specifically for Exosisters that worked out incredibly well. It was more so being able to play under something like D-Shifter and being able to try and break through board locks in the form of stuff like the um, Barry Statue. So with all of that out of the way, please smash that like button, hit that notification bell and subscribe so you don't miss out on any more upcoming content. I have also been requested to bring a Burning Abyss um, version of Dark Worlds and a version involving controls, which to be fair, I think I can get a build together that involves both of them very, very well. So I will do that for you guys. Now I'm just laying out pretty much the standard 12 cards. I never changed this. Um, there was actually a question that popped up on one of the forums the other day about not playing Genta at free. I was like, what? Are you out of your mind? Like I know initially when I put this deck together because I wasn't so familiar with it, I only played two Genta. But once I realised that it wasn't a once per turn, yeah, I know, Yu-Gi-Oh players can't read, we get it. It's just insane. Like you search out both your copies of the gate, the fact to confusion, uh, spring itself back to the board when it's banished was just, oh, mad. Uh, and then again, pretty standard on the Dark World lineup. It's rare that you actually really want to be changing this because, like I've said, the 12 cards at the top are the cogs that keep everything turning, the four cards at the bottom are interchangeable, um, and the reason I've gone with ones of everything rather than twos of certain ones is if you go with two silver, there's no guarantee you're actually going to be able to go first. So, by ultimately being able to do one and one, you have that ability of, right, if I go first, I'm going to search out silver instead of gold and go for a hand loop. If I go second, I'm going to go for gold for the double pop. There's all ways to do that because you'll be utilizing it more so going second off of your Grefa Dragon, uh, and then first you're going to be doing it off of Ceruli. Keep in mind, even if you go second, you can still give your opponent Ceruli and then make it trigger to make you discard gold. Uh, the beige is actually really important and did incredibly well in this. Because I was playing a boss monster in the extra deck that required a bit more fodder, but was so much worth it, um, beige put in a lot of work. Not only was he a free summon of a um, basically a dark world of the board when it, got discard uh, when it gets discarded, it also then gave me the ability to start bouncing back my hand resource. As a little preview, I was actually main decking the brainwashing as well, uh, and that put in a lot of work along with another Dark World card, which, you know, I was actually surprised about, but when I looked at it in a different way, which I'll explain to you when I get there, it actually puts in so much more work than I could ever imagine. For the normal summon, I went back to Fairy Tale Luna, and the reason I went back to Fairy Tale Luna is for that exact example up against Flunderies. I was expecting to be facing them. Um, people are starting to prepare for Photon Hypernova, so they're trying to get the last little bits of workings out of their decks, preparing for that matchup and everything else for the cash matchup. But the reason that Luna was so good, and the reason that Luna will also be good going forward against stuff like Kashtira as well, is because you can actually normal summon the Luna, use Luna's effect. And it's either going to bait out an interruption or what you're going to be doing in the form of a flunder matchup is you've got that ability to bounce that barrier statue whenever you feel that they're done with their combo or you need to get rid of it. Um, it will also give you that ability to kind of bounce the uh, cash tier XYZ monster, which will mean all of your zones will be unlocked. It will then also give you the ability to bounce the exosister XYZ. It's kind of like a trade off because what you're doing is with one card, you're forcing your opponent to try and stop it and then you can chain it or you're forcing your opponent to kind of interact with it in one way or another, which what what, what makes it really, really good. Um, and it just kind of outs a lot of issues. And so Luna is incredibly powerful. Even against something like Fenrir, yes, they can send another copy of Fenrir, which will actually help them out. It's a lesser case you want to do, but then straight away, they're then going to be decided whether they want to go, okay, well, I've activated that Fenrir, and now I'm going to banish the Luna. And you go, okay, whatever. Like, I'm not too bothered. I've got another copy in my hand. I'm good to rock and roll. I then also went back to the two catalyzers. This is because I was wanting to get into the rank fours more consistently. And the reason for that was, again, I was expecting to be facing these shifters. I was expecting to face board controls. Um, I was also expecting to be facing tier elements and everything like that. So I wanted to be able to get into with a combo between catalyzer and beige. I wanted to be able to get into a guaranteed dweller. I wanted to be able to get into a guaranteed uh, Baguska, Daguerres, anything I needed. Um, and they pretty much go lock the graveyard out. So a good go first option, a good go second option, and then just a general all-rounder option to give you your draw power. Of course, I was playing the Triple Fenrir still. This card is just insanely powerful, guys. It's one of the ones, if you have it, you'd be foolish not to play it. If you don't have it, 
don't worry, this deck is above 40 cards, I believe it's like a 46 card deck, so you can cut it down. If you do have access to the buy steals, you can easily put them in as well, but again, you're looking at cost inflations, whereas if you just look at all of these cards minus the Fenrir, all of these came in the structure there, and then the Lunas are incredibly cheap to pick up, and so are the Catalyzers. So, to this point, you're still able to play the deck, and even when we get to the dangers, you're still able to play it without breaking the bank, and still do incredibly well. It's all about reading the situations, adapting the deck for your local environment. Now, do not net deck this deck uh, if you're like, okay, cool, well, I can net deck this and it's going to do the exact same for me because the matchups may be different, uh, your local environment may be different, just everything else like that. For the dangers, I went with two Bigfoot, uh, two Nessie, two Mothman, one Jackalope, one Snake, one Thunderbird, and then an Omri danger, I suppose, is Zephyrus Elite because it's the only way you can discard that. Uh, and then again, this just helps your XYZ plays, it lets you bounce the danger back to the hand and go again. Um, I would actually arguably consider a Chupacabra instead of a Bigfoot because you want to keep these cards like Bigfoot and Thunderbird at a minimum because they are pretty much useless going first. And what I mean by that is, yes, there'll be a free monster on the board, but if they get sniped, which is something you cannot control, it will ruin your day. And that's the one thing about the dangers which a lot of people don't like is the fact that you cannot control it. You cannot control whether it's going to get hit. If your opponent is picking randomly or rolling a dice, like I always prefer my opponent to roll a dice because then it takes everything out of factor. Like there's no mind games of your opponent sees like, oh, that sleeve is a little bit more crooked than the other in the double sleeve or that sleeve's got like a little white damage scuff in the bottom corner like that one's the danger um so it kind of takes that all of out out of perspective and at the end of the day if they roll the dice that is exactly the danger you just go right okay well that is the way of the luck today um there were a couple of times when my dangers got hit obviously luckily when my mothman got hit it wasn't against a tier element matchup yes so the discard effect was completely online which is great moving into the spells Talents, I think Talents is actually really, really good this format, especially when you're looking at stuff like Fenrir's, when you look at stuff like um, the Kashtira Shangri-La, you also look at the Buy Steals as well. I feel Buy Steals, if tier elements do get hit on an upcoming ban list, Kashtira's will start paving the way because they don't need to rely on any lights and darks, which means if you're trying to utilize and um, activate the, the, um, the Buy Steals, you as the player playing the Buy Steals need to be putting the lights and darks in the graveyard. Um, on top of that as well, when you give your opponent Ceruli, the amount of times you'll activate talents and your opponent will go, I haven't activated anything, you go, yeah, you activate the Ceruli technically, so you get that effect off the back of that as well, which is, I think if you're able to trigger it, broken. Uh, double Allure, Double Ascension, uh, Double Gates, standard. One Archives, uh, I had a conversation with someone the other day about bumping up Archives. I can completely understand it. Um, I just feel the issue with Archives is that it's just one of the ones that requires more to do, like you need to have a dark world on the board in order to activate it. You then need to have two more, at least one more dark world and one more discard card in the hand in order to get the full effect to draw to ditch one. You can't literally go, okay, um, common mistakes are activate archives, discard a dark world without a dark world on the board. Doesn't work that way. Another common mistake is, oh, draw two, discard one. No, it's all part of an effect that you need to discard and draw two. Now, I'm not saying that that was what was happening, but it just requires so much additional setup. It's one of the ones that, yes, it's great to open up if you got all of the other components in play, but considering that Archives on its own, without being played at a later point in the turn, um, needs like three more cards to do anything. One Dark World on the board, one Dark World to discard, one Dark World to draw, uh, or another card to discard and draw two. Um, it's really one of the ones that you need the price set up. And then what I swapped from side deck to main deck was one puppetry. The reason I put this into the main deck is I was looking at it completely the wrong way. Uh, yes, obviously, target up to three cards in the graveyards and banish them. Now I was always looking like, well, if I activate that, my opponent's just going to chain a buy steal. But I stopped looking at it that way and I went, the chances are, 9 out of 10, if I go first, it's going to be my opponent that activates the buy steal. And the fact that it targets three cards in any graveyard, yes, it sucks, but if I target the one card that my opponent is trying to buy steal and banish that, they won't get their buy steal, which means they won't get Druid's Worm. Yes, they'll be able to reactivate that Druid's Worm or that Magnamute during their turn, but it means they don't get that deck fin search during my end phase, and it also means they don't get an additional body on the board during my turn. So when I started looking at it that way, Poppy was really good because I was able to go, okay, cool. I'm going to target the target that you targeted, get rid of it so that you can't summon, 
And then I'm going to discard a fiend and continue to make my plays going forward anyway. So it worked out really, really well. Uh, and then brainwashing actually did quite a lot, to be fair. Um, I feel this actually has more success in a bi-steel version, purely because the bi-steels also allow you to search in the end phase. But what I was finding myself doing a lot more with playing brainwashing was leaving a dark world on the board. Um, obviously the only downside is my opponent knows I have this nine times out of ten, and it is dead going second. So if I was going second, I would completely take it out. Um, and then that's where obviously all my side deck starts coming into play. So that's it for the main deck. I'm going to move on to the extra deck. It's all pretty straightforward and simple for the extra deck, I'm afraid. Um, there are a couple of little bit of spicy text that I'll save until the end. So what is standard? Well, double Greffa. Uh, that I've changed out. This card keeps coming in and out, in and out. Um, when I focus a bit more around the dangers, a cash it is a little bit more important. Um, if you want to, the next option that I would put in place of this is the um, Underworld Goddess. Entirely up to you, but Akashi actually put in a decent amount of work. Mark, uh, Mark Rucker, love this card. Uh, Cross Sheep, such a good card, especially when I wanted to go for like XYZ Turbo. Uh, IP, Unicorn, Zalantis, Skulldred, Appalooza. Uh, I'll save the spice till last. Uh, a Dweller, Daguerres, Baguska, Coach King, all pretty standard on this one. Again, I feel Coach King has a bit more um, place in the deck when you are focusing more on your level 8s, but it is just actually that good. Um, the fact that if you, your turns take quite long anyway, so if you start going out of your way to make the Coach King, as long as you don't get impermed or stop, which would suck, um, it's still very, very good. It's definitely a flex spot. It's entirely down to player preference. Um, otherwise, this should be a Hope Harbinger, which is really nice because if your opponent forgets to attack the Hope Harbinger uh, or the redirect of Hope Harbinger, they really lose the game. And then the Spice. Uh, the card that no one was prepared for and completely forgot this card couldn't be destroyed by battle is Boral Sword Dragon. Yes, I've gone with Funky Walk, Boral Sword, uh, but it's the only one that I could find, sadly. This card was insane. Like, so many people were waiting for an access code. And I was like, nah, bro, I'm going to go Boral Sword. I'm going to go Boral Sword with my Fenrir. I'm going to go Boral Sword with my um, Greffa. I'm going to go Boral Sword with my Rainbow. And everyone was like, what the hell is going on? Boral Sword OTK for game. And just people wasn't even expecting it. Like it dropped, and then people were like, um, what's going on? And how is this going to work? So, yeah, putting a huge amount of work on that one. And I was really, really happy with that. So, again, it's these little cards, especially if you're playing a deck over and over and over again. Your local environment will get used to it. They'll be like, right, okay, oh, he's, he's on Dark Worlds. I know what he's going to do now. But then when you start swapping up little cards like this, like you go away from the Lunar and you go to a Synchro version and then you go back to a Lunar and then you go into a Boral Sword, people are like, what the hell is going on? Uh, and then I'll go over my side deck. So my side deck is pretty standard. So Lava Golem, so Lunar's out, Lava Golem's in. Uh, obviously in the Flunder matchup, don't put Lava Golem in. Keep Lunar, just as good. Uh, triple Ghost Spell, like if games ever take too long. My locals is pretty decent to be fair, like not many games are getting to time now. So uh, I'm actually considering taking that out. But then I know the second that I take this out, all my games will start going to time and I'll be like, I wish I had this card. Uh, triple Evenly, boom, board wipe out. And then what I did is I changed up my go first card. So I dropped my skill drain from three to two. And I put two Raigekis in and two Twin Twisters in the form of um, Lightning Storms as well. Now it was a bit of a risk. But the reason I kind of did this um, is I just wanted to see how effective Raigeki was going to be. And Raigeki actually worked out quite nicely because it was really, really funny to be able to go, okay, Raigeki my opponent's entire um, entire board. And uh, for example, in the Flunder matchup, Raigeki their board. So I don't need to worry about... Um, I don't need to worry about the barrier statue, which is really nice. And then what I was able to do is like normal summon Lunar. At that point, if they choose to trigger... Uh, the effects to start bouncing everything back. I go, yeah, absolutely fine. And then when they were to go for one of their boss monsters that required two tributes, if they didn't have the spell card that allowed them to tribute one of my cards, once they activate Eagle to search out their level seven, if I was paying close enough attention, I would know that they would have no lower levels left. So I could then activate um, Luna to kind of bounce a card back. Alternatively on that one, they put the M pen down. I go, okay, fine. You finished everything? And I go, right, cool. Activate effect, bounce it back. Because keeping in mind that they would need to trigger the effect to add the M pen back um, if it had been destroyed by Regeki as well. So it was an interesting one. I don't think I'm going to keep it, but it was kind of cool. It was, it was interesting to play this now. Uh, and then Twin Twisters, I think, is pretty straightforward and simple, especially if you're going second uh, and your opponent like sets three or has two face out in one set. You just go Twin Twisters, discard Thunderbird, take all three of them out. So kind of a cool option. I was happy with it. Uh, anyway, 
that's pretty much it for the main extra and uh, side deck. I hope it's given you a couple of ideas on your own build. I hope it's given you a couple of an insights of um, some of the updates that you can make for the build as well. I still have incredible amounts of fun with this deck. I will try and get a control build together. Um, I like the control idea. And there is a spicy option for what makes the control build work quite nicely. Um, but that does come down to, you know, a very specific lineup. And the issue with any control build is that it predominantly uh, needs to be going first. And if it can't go first, it can sometimes start to struggle. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Any questions at all, please put them down in the comments below. Also, we are bringing back during the end phase podcast. So if you have any questions for that podcast, if you were a uh, previous listener or if you are a new listener, there are still some of the old episodes online. They'll be in the link in the description below. Um, so yeah, have a listen to those. Get used to the format. If you have any questions that you would like the team to be answering on said podcast as well, by all means, put them on the comments of either this video or if you put them on the comments of the specific post about the podcast, we will be more than happy to answer them for you live on said podcast as well. But for now, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share. Till next time, as absolutely always, stay safe and of course, happy dueling.